It's been 90 years, and no plane has ever beaten its speed. In 1933, Italy's Machi Castoldi MC-72 became the fastest piston-powered aircraft in history. It hit over 709 kilometers per hour on water. It was rivalry, politics, and a monstrous 24-cylinder engine that made this plane happen. Unfortunately, it killed three pilots before breaking the record. So how did this deadly red machine become the masterpiece the world could never outrun? The great rivalry. To understand that, we have to go back to the 1920s. It was a time when every country wanted to prove it could fly faster, higher, and longer than anyone else. Planes were evolving faster than cars, and every month brought a new world record. But one competition turned that ambition into obsession, the Schneider Trophy. This was not your casual Sunday air show. It was the Formula One of seaplanes, where nations raced over water at breakneck speeds, engines screaming just meters above the surface. The rules were brutal. You had to win three times in five years, and your country kept the trophy forever. That meant global bragging rights, and no one wanted them more than Italy. After World War I, Italy was rebuilding its national identity. Factories were reopening. Propaganda was everywhere. And Mussolini's regime needed proof that Italy wasn't just recovering. It was superior. And what better way to show it than by dominating the skies? But there was a problem, and it was Britain. By the mid-1920s, British engineering was unbeatable. Their supermarine racers, sleek and perfectly tuned, were breaking record after record. They were winning every race. Their aircraft were faster, more reliable, and refined to the last bolt. Every victory humiliated Italy, and each loss dug deeper into the nation's pride. In 1927, the Schneider Trophy was held in Venice, right on Italy's home turf. Crowds gathered, flags waved, and the entire country expected victory. Instead, Britain wiped at the floor. The loss was embarrassing and personal. Mussolini, watching from Rome, was furious. For him, this was about his ideology. The fascist regime saw technology as a symbol of strength, proof that Italy could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with industrial giants like Britain and the United States. Losing to the British, and on Italian soil, was a public relations disaster. Mussolini wanted revenge, and he wanted it fast. The solution was to build a plane so advanced, so fast, that no one would ever dare challenge Italy again. The government immediately poured resources into aviation. The Ministry of Aeronautics created a new elite division called the Scuola Alta Velocità, the high-speed school based at Lake Garda. Its mission was simple, but extreme, to reclaim Italy's pride through speed. They recruited the best pilots, the boldest engineers, and gave them one order, win the next Schneider Trophy. And to make that happen, one company got the ultimate task, Machi Aeronautica. This wasn't a normal contract. It came with government backing, military priority, and essentially a blank check. The man leading the project, Mario Castoldi, was an aeronautical genius. He was ambitious, stubborn, and fearless. He had already designed successful racers before, but this challenge was on a whole new level. His goal was to build the fastest seaplane in history. But just as work began, the news hit that Britain had done it again. In 1929, they claimed their second victory with the Supermarine S6, setting yet another world record. One more win, and they would keep the Schneider Trophy forever. That rattled Italy's entire aviation scene. Castoldi knew what that meant. Faster wasn't good enough anymore. If Italy wanted to reclaim its pride, they needed something revolutionary, a machine so powerful and precise that it would rewrite the limits of flight itself. And that's how the idea for the Machi Castoldi MC-72 was born. Everything about this plane screamed obsession. Its body was long and razor thin, its twin floats shaped like knives slicing the water. Every inch of its frame was sculpted in wind tunnels to squeeze out every last drop of speed. And the color was bright red, not just for looks, but so observers could track it as it blurred across the lake at impossible speeds. But what made the MC-72 truly insane was its engine. It had the Fiat AS6, a monstrous V24 engine producing over 3,000 horsepower. Essentially, it was two V12s fused together, nose to tail, running in perfect synchronization. It was louder, hotter, and more temperamental than any engine before it, the kind of power that could lift a nation's ego or tear a plane apart mid-flight. And that's exactly what it almost did. In the race for speed, every design choice came with danger. Engineers were experimenting with metal alloys, fuel mixtures, and propeller configurations that no one had ever tested at those speeds. One mistake could turn the plane into a fireball, but that didn't stop them. Every crash was followed by another test. Every failure made the obsession grow stronger. Because for Mussolini in Italy, this wasn't about a trophy anymore. It was about pride. 
they were racing time, expectations, and fear itself. By the early 1930s, Italy was all in. The MC-72 had become more than a machine. It was a political weapon, a national statement, and a gamble that would either make or break Italian aviation. But before this red monster could fly into history, it had to survive its own power. And that's where the story takes a darker turn, the part where men risked their lives for speed and three of them never came back. Because to build the fastest plane in the world, Italy first had to learn how easily speed can kill, building the beast. The MC-72 wasn't designed to be graceful or practical. It was made for one thing, speed. And its bright red paint wasn't chosen for looks. It was chosen so that observers could actually see it as it streaked across Lake Garda at hundreds of kilometers per hour. The red blur became Italy's symbol. The structure itself was a masterpiece of extremes. The front half of the fuselage was all metal. The rear was lightweight wood to shave off precious kilograms and balance the machine. Even the wings were not ordinary. They used flush-mounted radiators, thin cooling panels built directly into the surface so air could flow smoothly over them. Even the floats, which are those elegant pontoons that allowed it to take off from water, doubled as cooling systems. Inside them ran a network of pipes circulating oil and coolant through a two-stage loop, bleeding heat into the air without slowing the plane down. That was the level of madness behind this design. Cooling was so important here because sitting in the nose of this plane was a beast unlike anything ever put in the air, the Fiat AS6 engine. Imagine taking two massive V12 engines, bolting them back to back and forcing them to work as one. That's what they did. The result was a 24 cylinder monster producing over 3,100 horsepower with nearly 50 liters of displacement, more than four times the size of a tank engine at the time. It was mechanical insanity. The power was unreal, but the problems were worse. The heat and pressure were so extreme that even steel began to fail. Engineers went through over a thousand valves, trying 10 different alloys of metal before finding one that wouldn't melt under the stress. It took 18 brutal months of trial and error before the engine could even run for more than a few minutes without breaking down. And just when they thought they had it under control, it exploded. In 1931, during test flights, tragedy struck. Two of Italy's finest pilots, Captain Giovanni Monti and Lieutenant Bellini, were killed when their MC-72's engine detonated midair. A third pilot from another test team also lost his life soon after. The nation was shaken. Even for an era when aviation was experimental and deadly, this was devastating. The very machine that was supposed to bring glory was now claiming heroes. Investigators tore the wreckage apart and finally discovered the cause, ram air. At high speed, around 400 kilometers per hour, the force of incoming air at the intake created so much pressure that it leaned out the fuel mixture. That meant the engine ran too hot and then detonated like a bomb. Ironically, the solution came from their biggest rival, the British. A British engineer named Rod Banks was invited to help diagnose the issue. He redesigned the air intake, adjusted the fuel mixture, and developed a new high-octane fuel blend that changed everything. It was volatile, corrosive, and had to be handled by mechanics wearing gloves and masks, but it worked. The engine finally ran reliably. The beast had been tamed. By now, though, time was running out. The Schneider Trophy was about to end. The British had already won twice. If they won again, they would keep the trophy forever. And in 1931, they did. The British Supermarine S6B, the direct ancestor of the future Spitfire, hit a top speed of 547 kilometers per hour securing permanent ownership of the trophy. The Italians couldn't even compete. With several planes unfinished and their test pilots gone, they had no choice but to withdraw. The loss stung deeply, but Italy wasn't done, not even close. Now the mission was to break the world airspeed record. At the heart of this final push was one man, Francesco Agello. He wasn't the most famous pilot, nor the most daring, but he was steady, calm, and utterly fearless. After the earlier crashes, he was the only pilot left who truly understood the MC-72. He had flown it in training, he knew its limits, and he respected its danger. In April 1933, the order finally came. The weather had been unpredictable for days, but when the skies cleared over Lake Garda, it was time. The red machine was rolled onto the water, gleaming under the sun. Mechanics checked the fuel lines one last time. Observers positioned their cameras, and a jello climbed into the cockpit. The Fiat AS6 came alive with a deafening roar. Twin propellers spun in opposite directions, canceling out the torque that would normally twist a plane this powerful. The float skimmed across the lake, kicking up water and then lift off. The crowd below held its breath. Agello lined up for his run, a three kilometer course marked by red and white buoys. The plane streaked past once, twice, five times. 
faster and faster with every pass. When he landed 20 minutes later, the crowd erupted. The flight was perfect. Now all that mattered was the number. When the Fédération Aéronautique Internationale confirmed the data, the world gasped. It was 682 kilometers per hour, or 424 miles per hour, a new world record, not just for seaplanes, but for any piston-powered aircraft ever built. Francesco Agello was officially the fastest man alive. But for Italy, even that wasn't enough. They believed the MC-72 could go further. They wanted 700 kilometers per hour, the mythical threshold no one thought possible. And so, the team went back to work. The record that wouldn't die. The team tore the aircraft apart once more. The Fiat AS6 engine was rebuilt and fine-tuned beyond recognition. The cooling system was redesigned. The carburetors were reshaped to feed that monstrous 24-cylinder engine more precisely. Every bolt, every screw, every drop of fuel were rechecked, recalibrated, and reimagined. They were chasing perfection. But with this plane, perfection came at a cost. Francesco Agello, now the only man trusted to fly it, kept returning to the cockpit even after near disasters. On May 13, 1934, the engine cut out midair. He barely made it back to the water. On June 4, another attempt ended after just eight minutes. Then a compressor failed weeks later. By July 4, violent vibrations nearly tore the aircraft apart. It was clear that the MC-72 didn't want to be tamed. Every flight was a war between man and machine. And the craziest part is that a jello flew with the canopy open. No pressure suit, no oxygen, just goggles, leather gloves, and raw nerve. At nearly 700 kilometers per hour, the wind hit like a weapon. The noise was deafening, the vibration brutal. The parachute he wore wouldn't have saved him at that height or speed. It was more psychological than practical, a reminder that he might still have a chance if fate decided to be kind. But on October 23, 1934, everything finally aligned. Mechanics ran last checks, and a jello climbed in. The AS-6 thundered to life, echoing across the mountains. The floats cut through the lake like knives until, at last, the MC-72 lifted off a streak of crimson over blue water. A jello made four passes across the timed course, each one faster than the last. 705.8, 710.4, 711.4 kilometers per hour. The final average was 709.2. He had done it. He had broken the barrier no one thought possible. No seaplane, even in 2025, has ever gone faster. The MC-72 was officially retired after that flight. There were rumors of unofficial test runs exceeding 730 kilometers per hour, but the truth didn't matter. The record stood and the legend was born. Winter arrived, budgets dried up, and Italy quietly ended the program. The plane that had cost lives, money, and sanity was finally rolled back into its hangar. Even as jet engines took over the skies, no one ever tried to beat the MC-72's record. There was no point. The world had moved on, and piston-powered speed records became a thing of the past. There were discussions inside Machi about converting it into a land-based record plane, removing the floats and adding wheels, but it never happened. The design was too complex, the cooling system too dependent on water. Had it worked, Italy might have owned both land and sea speed records at once. Francesco Agello lived long enough to see his record confirmed and his name etched into aviation history. But fate wasn't done with him. In 1942, while testing another aircraft, the Machi C-202 fighter, he collided midair and was killed instantly. The last pilot who truly understood the MC-72 was gone. Yet, the machine survived. The very aircraft that shattered history, serial number MM181, still exists today. It sits quietly at the Italian Air Force Museum near Lake Bracciano, its scarlet body gleaming under the museum lights. Do you think anyone will ever be brave enough to build something like it again? Share your thoughts with us in the comments section below. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss the latest aviation updates. We will keep you in the loop. Goodbye for now.